Hey, everybody, before we start the show, I wanted to let you know that I have a Kickstarter going on right now with Mike Shea of the DM's Deep Dive and Scott Gray. It's for Fantastic Lairs. And right now, there are going to be 20, count them, 20 drop-in boss battles and lairs that you can put into your 5e games. And if you go to fantasticlairs.com right now, you can download two free lairs. That's two dungeons total totally free that you can drop in and start playing tonight. This is a really fun thing that we have created and we are so excited to bring to all of the backers. Thank you so much to those of you who have already contributed to this. So go check it out at fantasticlairs.com. This is Tabletop Babble. I'm James Intricasso. the show i am chatting with the one and only daniel d fox the creator of the zweihander rpg daniel is a marketing genius and so that is what we are talking about today how to market your games uh, this is really fascinating even if you are not a game creator you're gonna love the way this works it's gonna help you get your word out about whatever is important to you on social media and also you can learn about the tricks of the trade. Uh, Daniel was kind enough to share many, many of his secrets with us. So here is my conversation with him. Okay, everybody. Now I'm here with a giant in the tabletop gaming industry, a a level 30 uh, threat that we have here. Uh, Daniel, for people who don't know, who are you and what do you do in the tabletop role-playing game industry? Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm I'm Daniel Fox. Uh, I think I'm actually level 20 at this point. I think level 30 is resigned for people like um, Mike Rose and Jeremy Crawford. But oh, I, I but see. I, but I appreciate <laughs> the praise. You're up uh, there. You're right <laughs> up there with them. You're right up there. <laughs> I, I I made a, a, a silly elf game um, about three years ago called Zweihander RPG. And this started, you know, many, many moons ago, like a lot of RPGs do, but over, over time, kind of, you know, in brief, like it turned into a Kickstarter and then it turned into kind of a, a, a breakout kit. It won an any for best game product of the year at Gen Con. And now um, I, I, I left a 16 year career in, in digital marketing to uh, headline the show. Andrew Zafino is our executive creative director was why Hinder at the center of our growing RPG unit. That's my, that's, that's, that's me in brief, besides the fact that I'm a 43-year-old uh, husband and father. That's, that's yes. it. Yes. Interview over. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We're done. We're done. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much to, to talk about just in that, um, right? The fact that Andrews McNeil is making role-playing games uh, is like an amazing thing, that they have like a role-playing game department, I guess? A wing? What would you call it, right? You're, you're making role-playing games there. That's so cool. Yeah, the you know so Anders McNeil, for those who don't know, um, have been around for fifty years, and they're a traditional publisher. But but what's really what's really interesting about Anders McNeil is that they've kind of operated in the syndicated comic space for many many years. So Foxtrot, Doonesbury, Garfield, you know things like that. Um, that's been kind of the 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 the, the heart of, of of Anders McNeil in Kansas City, and that's extended obviously to illustrated authors. Um, and, and, and that's continued to grow now their next kind of big hit, like probably like a couple, two, three years ago was finding Rumi Kapoor, who was a very renowned poet. And now the poetry space is huge with Andrews McNeil at the head of that. So Andrews McNeil kind of owns that syndicated comic space. They kind of own the, the poetry space and, and other illustrated books. Um, and, 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 and I remember I, I lived downtown Kansas city for, for years and I would, my running route, I would take my nightly run and it was right by the building and I had no idea what they did, but I knew they did newspaper stuff. This was when I was 20 something and didn't know anything about anything. So I was like, oh, I recognize those cartoon characters in there. Very cool. And now turn to, you know, 20 plus years later, I'm working here headlining their RPG unit because they, they, they see, they see an opportunity with it. Um, in, in my, my kind of pathway into the company was kind of, um, uh, different uh in, in in that i started out as a published author with them and as i as i had my conversations with my my acquisitions editor patty rice it, it led to oh maybe there's an opportunity to potentially turn this into like a 
an RPG department, a division. So uh, after a you know about a four and a half month period of meeting with their C suite and talking with their marketing team and sales and showing them the numbers, basically making a case study and developing a business case to say you should be in RPGs and not, not only just publish Zweihander, but you should stand up an RPG unit. And here's the numbers why. Here's the reasons why. Um, here are the the things that people love about RPGs and why it aligns with Andrews McNeil's kind of company values. They said, "Okay, let's let's make it happen." So, um, ten months later, almost to the day, uh, I started on I started on a Tuesday, uh, literally ten months to the day, um, and I've been slowly you know, at this point um, building up the department, laying out the business plans, talking about kind of our three year roadmap, working on the fun businessy stuff on the back end while in parallel, um, you know, launching our Zweihander uh, supplements, getting our new artists and writers on board, um, setting up our organized play program, essentially all the things that, that an RPG company needs to do to run the same race everybody else is already doing. Because Andrew McNeil, you know, obviously it's a new division, it's new department, um, if you will. So there's a lot of there's a lot of learnings that have to be imparted from me to them, and then from them to become believers in, and then to say, okay, let's put budget against it because we know that if we're going to do this for real, you know, which we are, they're committed to in investing in it. Um, we have to the baseline requirements for an RPG company are organized play, growth of the platform, um, continue bringing on new artists, grow grow the stable of writers bring in diverse writers and be inclusive in our values because it is a value of the company and a value of Zweihander and then set ourselves up for success by just executing against it. So the, the, the super businessy stuff has been like my, my world since joining, since joining here. And obviously a lot of that, that history, my 16 year veteranship in digital advertising has been instrumental in kind of standing up this new division of why we're, why we're talking today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? And I I wanted to have you on. Uh, we had a Twitter conversation. I was like, how do I market things? I don't really know yeah. about marketing, <laughs> um, which feels like a weird thing to say since I, I work in this industry a lot for myself and, and am able to more or less support myself doing that, right? And it's But it is a weird thing to say. And I think Zweihander is a great example of like, Wow, you can really do something amazing uh, with the internet uh, and with marketing. Um, and I was hoping you could, as we before we get into our conversation, just sort of set up the credentials, brag about uh, how well Zweihander has done, um, because uh, right, it's the number one RPG on Drive Through. Right? Is is that correct? That it's the best selling RPG on Drive Through RPG. Yeah, it's it's one of twenty now because obviously there's a, there's a lot of great RPGs kind of coming in now that have IP to tied to it. So that's that's obviously driven a lot of sales. But I think that to talk about where Zweihander is now is to really kind of understand where where it started. Um, and and when I had when I first started developing this thing, um, it was it was literally just a game we we're making in the basement. It was it was not intended for publication. Um, I had no delusions of grandeur about becoming a professional game designer. Um, I was literally just making this game for my own game table. Um, it was at the point, it was kind of a, we were, we took some of the same DNA that Warhammer has. And I was like, well, I don't want to tie it to my own world. So it started out as this kind of small thing called core hammer. And over time, like the, the, the play testers, um, I, the people get game with every Wednesday was like, you should publish this. And I'm like, I have no idea how to publish. <laughs> and so that leads to a whole exploration about Kickstarter and how do you print books and all of the, all the stuff that it's like if designing a game and developing a game is a lengthy process, if you don't have those, that knowledge uh, uh, about how to actually produce something, um, that, that's it, that, that can take a long time. Um, I, I, I consider myself a, a pretty good study, if only because my, my job, my day job at the time, for many, many years was really about business development. So I, I, I learned somewhat quickly, I guess you could say, uh, you know, because I had to, uh, how to make this thing real. And so over time, brought it to Kickstarter. It, it, I think it raised like $67,000, my first Kickstarter I ever ran. Um, and then it raised another 125000 in crowd ox. So it turns into this like quarter million dollar thing. 
And so we produce it and make it and it, you know, it takes a village. There's a lot of people who help bring that together. And then, and then it's, uh, we submitted it randomly to Gen Con to the any awards and it ends up winning best game product of the year. And we're just like, how is this, how to get <laughs> to this point? Right? Like it, it, it felt, it felt unreal. Um, because we, I mean, we had, I've been certainly marketing it, if you will, online. Um, and I'll, we'll talk about that probably a little bit later in the conversation, but that leads to continued growth. And, and before, you know, I really, before Andrews McNeil agreed to publish the book, it was, I think it had been, it was at 52,000 physical books sold at that point. Um, just as a, literally, I had a distribution center in Kansas City, Kansas. I live in Kansas City, Missouri. I was doing a pretty strong digital marketing campaign to drive PDF sales. Um, and when I look at the sum of the whole, like it was, it was growing to the point where I knew that there was something there. Um, and, I, and I think it was an appetite in the market. I think it was just kind of you know, lightning a bottle. Like it was the right time, the right place, the right game. Um, because at this point, dark fantasy, you know, Game of Thrones had just come out on HBO. A lot of dark fantasy properties were starting to become more popular. I think people were looking toward like there's some high fantasy fatigue. So um, I, when I introduced it, um, it, it, I think it was just kind of timed right. Um, and I can't take the sole credit for it because I think there's a lot of other factors that contributed to it. But, but I can say that, you know, why it's grown as quickly as it has the last two to three years is because of a, 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 a strong marketing plan um, that is geared toward digital. Digital in the sense that... Um, driving engagement online physical books are important for game stores physical books are important for conventions but the reality is is that conversations about rpgs are happening on twitter particularly with younger younger audiences it's happening on facebook too with people who are already entrenched in rpgs forums are kind of this weird nebulous area that we'll probably talk about too because i'm sure some questions will come up about that but ultimately, I knew that in order to, to grow awareness, because really the, your biggest challenge with any RPG is like, how do I get people to play my game? Um, and that's an awareness play. I knew that to, to, to make it su successful, uh, and I think we can define that as book sales, uh, to be completely mercenary about it. We define success by book sales, so the way to get people to buy books is to talk to people online and engage with people online in relevant ways that aren't intrusive, that are natural and organic um, and talk about the game and then have them talk about it too. Cause I mean, it's one thing to, to throw up a billboard on the side of the, the road and say, Hey, here's, here's a local Hellsberg diamond, you know, like a jeweler down the road. It's another thing to say, Oh, well, my wife or her friends are now talking about why Hellsberg diamonds is important. It's another thing. Basically, if you can turn, that audience into your cheerleaders, uh, that's, that's like a, that's a, that's a win condition. Um, and where, in where in particular, I'm sure you're aware of this, um, where, where D and D has masterfully executed uh, a digital marketing plan where they can just put out kind of like, here's what we're releasing, but everybody else can talk about it, which is awesome. Yeah, they really can. Right. <laughs> Mike Shea, Sly Flourish on Twitter, he has all these Python scripts that sort of track D and D hashtags and he can show you like right when a product is announced, the big spike that happens that goes up every time a game is released and the number of people who are talking about it, you know, talking about D and D and that sort of thing is incredible. And I, you know, some of that seems logical, right? But it also, it's the machine that's been built around it. Oh, look at Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, right? That book basically was leaked <laughs> by Amazon and then became a, the number one best-selling book on Amazon the day it was released, right? Just in pre-order. So there's something there and there's something about digital marketing, right? That I think feels like a, a little bit of a mystery to people. And I think it's some of it's because of those circumstances you're talking about, some of which are not in our control. But then there are other things that we can do. And so 
in talking about marketing or in setting up this conversation, rather, you and I decided to take some questions from people. And so we set up a Google form. So thank you to everybody who submitted. There's a bunch of questions here, um, which is really, really great. And I thought we could start with a question from Jake, uh, who uh, has not provided us with any other handle. So we'll just go with Jake, who wants to know, what is the biggest mistake that you see uh, RPG creators or publishers make when it comes to marketing their products? And how is that mistake fixed? Yeah. So uh, first, thanks. Thanks for the first question, Jake. I, I, you know, I can, I I can draw from my own lessons and and I, and and I'll caveat my, my answers by saying, this is my experience. There are some universal truths in digital marketing. Um, I do feel that digital marketing for RPGs is is a new territory um, for a lot of a lot of publishers. It is a it is, but it's also kind of a Pandora's box, right? You open it up, and it's like there's so many different experiences uh, between different publishers about what's effective and what isn't. So, so you know, I, I although I do have 16 years of experience in digital advertising, um, I, I do I do ask that people think about the answers for what's relevant to what they're doing, because not every answer I'm going to give is like the truth. But um, I, I, I can say, you know, for, in relation to the question, now that kind of get the, 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 the default stuff out of the way, like my, <laughs> my little asterisks, like uh, before you read this, I would say that, that you know, one of the, one of the biggest mistakes uh, that, that, that l- let's look at it from two different perspectives. Um, one, which is the indie creator, meaning, someone creating their first game um, or a second game or third game. And the second, we'll look at it from the perspective of actual middle grade RPG publishers. So uh, the first and foremost, you know, to say, you know, what's the biggest mistake is that, you know, paid advertising for small creators is cost prohibitive. Um, not everyone has the ability to afford banner ads, in particular on web forms. And I can tell you from my experience um, that banner ad placements on web forms are a losing proposition. And because, uh, and this is a universal truth, is not only, not only is RPG marketing a mystery to some degree for publishers, say for perhaps Wizards because they're powered by Hasbro, um, and maybe Andrews McNeil because of my own experience and our team's experience, but um, also because web form owners don't know anything about the CPC model, the cost per click model. They don't know how to they don't know how to control impressions because what you're really paying for on a banner placement for web forms is a certain number of impressions. In a traditional advertising world, you'd pay you'd pay a certain cost per impression. You pay a certain cost per click. Um, my experience with the three big ones, who I won't name, um, has been mixed too poor at best. And, and this is through, and, I, and this is not just like a one-off banner ad. This is, you know, full transparency, you know, a, a $10,000 media campaign that I ran for a year straight uh, during the, 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 after the first Kickstarter for Zweihander. Now, granted, that was four years ago. Um, things may have changed. I don't think they probably have. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, probably lean away from from paid ads on web forums yeah i feel like maybe there's fewer people on forums than there were four years ago maybe that's right you know so and and, and that's and that that is 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 you know that's what i'm talking about is that if if the the largest growing audience in rpgs and in anybody who's anybody who plays D &D, anybody who's online or heck anybody who lurks at wizards understands this is that the largest growing audience are people beneath the age of 30. Um, they're coming in through the vector of actual play. They're not talking about RPGs on web forums. Web forums are kind of the, the conclave of the entrenched RPG creator, get gamer. Now, granted, some younger people certainly post on web forums, but the reality is that most of those RPG conversations today uh, are not taking place on web forums. It's mostly about people who've been talking about the same games for years. Uh, most of those conversations take place on social media. So, of course, banner ads are going to be ineffective there um, because I think that we can also all agree that people who are entrenched in their beliefs about RPGs are not as open to try <laughs> new games. And and yes. there is an and in and, and, and the interesting. I just gave this big talk on this, and this is a little bit off topic, but 
you know, younger gamers have been playing, start came in through D&D, and they're in their four to five, five year cycle, right? That's why D&D re-editions are four to five years. And in fact, there's a parallel between when people start playing RPGs and then start looking at other RPGs, and it's usually around four to five years. Um, now, I don't know if this is necessarily why D&D re-editions every four to five years, but that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a measurable, it's a measurable truth. Um, people start looking at other games. So naturally, they go to the people they're playing D&D with or talking about D&D with on social media. Like, what else is out there for me to try? So in, a, in, a, in, a, in essence, like this, what I'm saying is that social media has become the replacement for the web form. So the way, the way that you fix that, uh, so to speak, um, if you're a smaller creator, is that, you know, set aside a small budget. I had the exact same conversation with, uh, with, with Mike Shee of Sly Flourish about how to use effective Facebook ads. The great thing about Facebook, even though um, the conversations there are different tonally than Twitter, because Twitter is obviously limited by its character count. Um, the good thing about Facebook is that you can have a, a forum-like experience in private groups, and more importantly, um, with the way Facebook ads work, you can target by demographic, so you can get very, very specific with age group, interests, um, country, things like that. So with Zweihander, uh, I would target people who had who liked D and D, um, who liked dark fantasy genre interest, and were within a certain age group and demographic. And I continued honing my my paid ads that way. And I did it with a very very small ad. I mean, we're talking like a hundred dollars um, out of the Kickstarter funds just to kind of test it. Um, and over time, it became you know for me as a small indie creator, became the 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 paid the paid uh, marketing play I did to grow awareness because my con my concern wasn't necessarily about go out and buy a book it was more so about hey do you know about this thing because there's there's two there's two things to keep in mind whenever you look at RPGs which is if you're doing any sort of like paid advertising you have one of two goals you can't it's either conversion or awareness am I going to bring people to buy my book or am I going to bring people to talk about it and realize that it's there because those two things don't oftentimes pair together. So um, for the small time creator to really distill this down into like actual plain speak, you, you, your conversations about RPGs need to be happening in social media circles. Um, and, 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 and I would redirect your efforts away from web forums, not to denigrate the fact that there are some great web forums that I'm still a participant in by any means, but the reality is, is that you're gonna get more traction online and build more. You're going to build awareness faster uh, using social media tools than you than you will by using web forums. So that's that's the that's the that's the indicator. So to look at it from the publisher side, what I see some publishers, and I, I'm not going to name any names. Uh, this is just purely observational. Once again, like I see some people doing some very very smart things. Um, what we know, like we learned before that the primary vector for young gamers is through actual play. Um, and we can look at Critical Role as an example. Critical Role has been the single, the single biggest driver for D&D &D interest in the last five years. It's incredible and, and, and it's amazing. And, and what they're doing is really cool. And they're, they're very honest and very earnest about what they do and, and, and what they do. It's, once again, at the end of the day, it's just a game they're playing, but people like the characters, they like the, the players behind the game, the, 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 the characters they they like the game so that's that's the vector in for young gamers for first time gamers is through actual play critical role in many other shows now but what publishers I think are missing out on um, is the value of that I think we have to recognize uh, as as I would call some middle grade publisher because that's kind of where Andrews and Neil sits um, we have to recognize that actual play if that is the vector that younger gamers are coming in that is the best place to put our advertising dollars because we, 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 we know that is, is, is how people are learning about games. People are talking about games on social media, sure. Um, but to put something in front of somebody in an immediate way is to really is to work with um, the influencer market. To use advertising terms is like, hey, find the biggest influencer in that region and, and pay them to talk about it. But, but when it comes to RPGs, it's a little bit different, right? Because it's not just saying, hey, here's some money, go, go play my game. Um, you know, with Critical Role as an example, um, they, they don't play games they don't like. Um, they, they, they don't take on, you know, ad buys for things like that. And it's the same thing for a lot of other paid RPG influencers. Um, I had a very long series of conversations with Adam Coble. I just talked to him last night about this. 
he asked me, he said, what do you look for as an RPG publisher when you look at influencers to work with? I'm like, well, do their values align with ours um, from a company to company and person to person? Are they genuinely interested in the game that we want them to play? And will they offer good constructive feedback during that gameplay that will potentially inform future design? Those are the three kind of like conditions I, I look for when we identified Encounter Roleplay, when we identified Adam Coble and others to be announced later this year. But those are the things that we look for uh, as a publisher and what publishers should be looking at is the value of RPG influencer markets. Um, I think that you can, you know, you can go out and buy big IP and it will bring you immediate audience. Um, IP has, brings with it a, a, a fan base. Um, but if you're creating original IP, um, it's, it's hard to get noticed. It's hard to build awareness if people aren't talking about that thing. And the best way to do that is really to sink your, your advertising budget, you know, not necessarily solely into actual paid influencer marketing, but um, to sponsor and to sponsor a one shot, to sponsor, um, you know, a season of a game to see one, how the market reacts to it and two, to use it as a tool to inform design. Because we, we also know that influencers, uh, because they're experts in playing RPGs, will give constructive feedback and will talk about and disassemble the game and interpret it differently than we, our intent may be. So there's there's value beyond just like building awareness. It's also value for how we potentially develop in the future or re-edition as an example. Um, those are those are great things about this. So those those are that, that I think is kind of the, you know, I'm really glad that Jake asked that question because that was been on my mind for a while. Like it's like because I looking back retrospectively and looking at kind of where Andrews with Neil is right now as Vinander, we are investing in in RPG influencer marketing, and I can look at you know like where where I spent a lot of wasted a lot of time on web forums that had little return at mm -hmm. best. Yeah, it's great to know from someone who has invested in some things and failed too, right? Like, ah, this wasn't a great investment. Um, it's great to, to have that advice so that we don't make those mistakes. I too have had problems with banner ads on forums, right? That it just doesn't generate the interest that uh, you think it's going to because it feels so targeted and it doesn't. Hey, everybody, just wanted to take a quick break to let you know that this episode of Tabletop Babble is brought to you by Cobalt Press and the pocket edition of the Creature Codex. Do you love the Creature Codex so much that you want to keep it close to your heart? Well, now you can. Get nearly 400 foes of the original Creature Codex for half the price, just $24.99. This smaller, soft cover version of the book is more convenient and portable. Plus, it's got great imaginative creatures like... The Keg Golem, the Shark Bowl Ooze, the Bar Brawl, the Hierophant Lich, the Wasteland Dragons, and many, many more, some of which were created by yours truly. Everything was playtested and built by the industry's best designers, plus me. Find out more at coboldpress.com. So with social media in mind, Phil Beckwith wants to know, uh, how do I best utilize the Twitter algorithm for reach? There's a lot of different approaches there, but, I, but I, I'm going to talk about it from, from one specific perspective, which is the use of hashtags. Twitter's algorithms are, 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 are kind of a mystery, I think, for a lot of people. And, and this includes the digital advertising world. They, they, are, they, they constantly are changing things on the back end that they don't let advertisers know about. Um, brands, I should say specifically, uh, you know, where to give you a little background. Um, on my 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 last three years uh, in advertising before I decided to 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 leave on my own accord and, and work in RPGs full time, I worked for a company called VML YNR. And if you don't know who they are, you you you've you've probably seen their their Wendy's Twitter handle, um, ran by a gentleman. I'm an, I'm gonna name, name check him. His name is Matt Keck. Uh, he also coincidentally wrote the Feast of Legends RPG for Wendy's. Um, oh, okay. He's, Great. He's Great a, to have a name for that. <laughs> he is like the social media master. You know, he's, he's created a whole brand around Wendy's Twitter. And that, that, that's kind of the background here. So when I, when I looked at how to, you know, for lack of a better term, quote, weaponize um, a social media handle, um, my, what I wanted to do was create recognizable hashtags around Zweihander uh, that were extremely shareable and then teach the the Twitter algorithm to auto-promote 
um, in some cases, and, and also to create an attribution with the end user about that. So my, my two go-to tweet uh, hashtags um, are Zweihander RPG, and I used Grow Imperialist for a while, but that didn't quite work. So now it's TTRPG because TTRPG is is if you I so I use a tool called Crimson Hexagon. This is super super nerdy, by the way. Uh, That's Crimson what I Hexag- want. That's what I want. <laughs> Crimson Hexagon is a, a paid tool you can use to monitor social media to understand what engagement looks like uh, with names, brands, hashtags, things like that. Um, and I monitor these things. And what I what I see. Um, when I look at the engagement rates for Zweihander, I see a hierarchy of hashtags. And that hierarchy is D&D, TTRPG, and then Zweihander RPG. So in order to bring people who are talking about D&D to talk about Zweihander RPG, I have to put that middle rung in. That middle rung is TTRPG. So um, I always, I, what I try to do with all my posts, I'm, I'm imperfect about this, but in a, in a perfect world, um, Use two, no more than two hashtags. Uh, you introduce three and it will confuse the engine. It's not effective. Um, but limit your hashtag usage in your posts. And if you can, um, when you create your social media posts, put your hashtags after the call to action, meaning after the URL. Don't try not to put it actually in the body of the message because what, 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 what the advertising world basically calls thumb stoppers. So we know that the most common uses for Twitter is on your phone. I um, mean, getting somebody to stop with their thumb and say, oh, interesting. Um, usually it's an image. Uh, usually it's a strong call to action. Usually it's something controversial. Uh, but if that message is littered, literally littered with hashtags, it's ineffective. So that, that, that's, that's the Twitter approach. But the Instagram approach is very different because Instagram, you actually benefit from having multiple hashtags. Um, and what I can do, I think after this, whenever you post this online, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to snippet out some examples from my own Instagram to show effective ways how to use hashtags there. But if we're, if we're, if we're, if we're, thinking, about, if we're thinking about social media from the perspective strictly from hashtag usage and creating connectivity to people who are talking about RPGs online, through Twitter, less is more. Uh, for Instagram, more is better. Uh, because those, those are two entirely different social media tools that, that warrant different approaches uh, because the goals for Instagram are really about showing off pretty pictures. And the way you do that is by using hashtags to, 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 to bring the algorithm to raise that thing up. And the way that you, you bring, you, you I say trick, but the way you work the algorithm for Twitter to bring you into conversations about other, other uh, parallel RPGs is to find hashtags that basically create a chain from D and D to your own game, and and I think that that hashtag, at least in my experience, is is literally TTRPG and Zweihander RPG. Wow, that so that is really good to know because I uh, I definitely on Twitter have subscribed to for years the like put a bunch of hashtags in there, uh, and that's really good to know. Like, oh, okay, because one, it's annoying to have to type out that many. <laughs> it feels, yeah. it, it does feel like the tweet itself is littered, right? Like, it, and it's like, oh, this feels like such a marketing thing now. Um, so yeah, that's really good to know that like, okay, you don't need as many on Twitter, but the Instagram approach is still, that is a viable way to do things. And that's probably why we're getting them confused, right? That's that's right, and in fact, for Instagram, so Instagram supports thirty hashtags, and 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 what, what one thing that is also interesting about Instagram, which is kind of um, incongruent with what I just said, is that Instagram users will they still use thumb stoppers, but Instagram users will still read what's below the post. So when you put your hashtags in, as opposed to just putting them in the string, what you do is you create create an ellipsis that's a line break, so like a dot line break, dot, line break, dot, line break, and then your row of hashtags. And whenever somebody's flipping through Instagram, they won't see the row of hashtags. They'll see just the snippet at the top. So basically, you don't have to worry about littering the reading pane with hashtags. It falls below the fold when you're, when you're browsing on your phone. So you can still have your hashtags there. Uh, your, your character limits, obviously, there's none on Instagram. Um, but you can still utilize a hashtag strategy to include it so it works the algorithms to your favor. 
That's very cool. So another thing that you do a lot of um, is you do giveaways. Uh, you, you're often, uh, depending on, sometimes on a holiday, like on Veterans Day, I saw that you were offering veterans copies of Zweihander. You'll do contests and things like that. And so Kate, who is at Philnin on Twitter, wants to know, how do you reach your audience with a free product? And then in parentheses, with the hope of selling some DLC products later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think that, that so there, you know, the, the human side is in the, in the human side of this, of this kind of equation is that it's, it's a good thing to give games away. Full stop. Because we know that, that there are just some people who, who don't have expendable income um, to play these games, and we, and we as publishers or creators or whatever we may be, are are in a are coming from a point of a certain privilege in that we have we have we are in this position where we're at, and and we should. I'm, I'm a firm believer in like, like, can we share in our experiences? Can we share in our in our successes? And I and I feel as a create as a, like as, as a, from an indie creator like I I did this very early on too as Fighthander was I wanted to give people an opportunity to play without having to buy it. Um, now the, the 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 marketing side the reality is is that the best way to get somebody to review a game is to just give them a book. Um, and 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 you can give away PDFs all day. You can give away digital products all day. And, <laughs> And the reality, and it's hard to get people to to do a review for that. But when you give somebody like a physical artifact, um, they have like the weight, the heft of the book in the hand, and they get it in the mail, and it's signed by the creators and the artists. Like that's something meaningful and special. So it's it's it's. And although I don't I don't ask people for reviews when we give things away, people nine times out of ten will do it because they they have some feeling or sense of it or thought about the thing they've received. And, 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 and what I also find is that um, the reviews that do come from that are generally, they're not bad, but if, they, if, they're, if they're either good or they're constructive, um, because constructive criticism is far more useful in a review than a bad review. Um, so we've, we find that giving somebody a book, they're, they're typically going to give us a review of the book on, on Amazon, or maybe they do it um, on drive through RPG. But there's, there, there's value in doing that um, because it, 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 one, it kind of sh- you, you kind of show that hey, my values are that or our values as a publisher is that we want everyone to be able to afford and play our games, um, and then two, it's it's a super shareable thing. Like people, like I, I remember the first time I got a a first my first free RPG, um, and and it was a it was a copy. And this is recently, coincidentally, the first time I ever received a free RPG. Um, was for the Dallas RP Dallas role playing game because so I was talking about it randomly on social media. Oh right, and, yes, I and, that. And, and I'm like, I post, I'm like, look at this amazing game. This is crazy. How is this real? Um, you know, and like my next step is I'm gonna unbox it on Twit on Twitch. It's still wrapping the original wrapping, and I'm gonna I'm gonna hopefully play it. Um, we're talking to some people kind of through back channels right now. Another publisher about actually playing this game on Twitch. So. Um, you know, immediately, like, even though Dallas, a role-playing game, came from an RPG game store, not from a publisher, like, I mean, as I started talking about it, like, that's the sort of thing that happens, like, when you get, I, you know, it sounds kind of silly, but you get cool stuff from publishers, and you're, like, you're likely to talk about it, you're likely to, to say, hey, this is really neat, check this out, look at this book, and that's super shareable content, and, and, and it goes right back to the value of social media. Social media, um, in, in, in a lot of ways, uh, can 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 be can be used for for good. It can be used for bad too, but to be used for good, people like to show off the things that they get, and and it's always fun and cool, and and you know, and it and it makes it, it makes the publisher look good, it makes the authors look good, it makes the people who receive the book feel good, and then everybody else who's following that person who received the book will also start engaging with that content. So, if you if you use the the hashtag uh, strategy I was talking about. And you have that attribution between D and D to your game, with TTRPG being the little rung. Um, you can turn that into shareable content, um, and and that can help build awareness in a in a RPG market that is flooded <laughs> with new <laughs> RPGs every day. Not the bad way. I love it, but it it is. There's sure. a lot of RPGs out there. Yeah, yeah, it's totally true. And you know, I to to that sort of 
point, that sort of brings me to the next question, which comes from uh, Justice Armin, who is at Justice underscore Armin on Twitter, uh, wants to know, many tabletop role-playing game creators are going solo, they're juggling their full-time job, uh, they're also doing the marketing for the game that they are creating, they might be playtesting, they're probably project managing, and doing a bunch of other things. Um, so with like a limited slice of time, uh, for marketing, do you have a best place where you recommend creators focus their energy? Yeah, so I, I, I think that their call out is very important to, to recognize that RPG creating RPGs doesn't end by simply saying putting pencils down, saying I'm done. There's there's the art, there's the product project management, there's the constant fan engagement, there's a responding to emails, there's the managing the Discord. There's to manage the social media account. I mean, and doing your full-time job and being potentially a family person and having a social life and having your gaming life too. <laughs> so right. we, we, we have to first recognize that, that making RPGs, um, you know, is, is not, it is not easy because the, the work, the hard work begins after you put pencils down that the making the RPG thing, it can be lengthy. It can be arduous. But it's not difficult um, because anybody, I'm a strong believer in anybody can make an RPG. It may not be good, but anybody can make an RPG. But the real hard work, which is where, you know, I think that we um, as, as creators are not, what we're not good at doing is mentoring other people in that same situation. Um, Adam Coble and I have talked pretty extensively about this. In fact, um, one of the first people he mentored in now works for us. Um, uh, Nora Cahill, she does all of our Roll20 development uh, because I'm a, I'm a strong believer in mentorship and the value in that and then helping bring marginalized people into the fold. So um, to, to get back to what the, the, the heart of the question, though, is really to talk about where, where, do, you, where do you spend your time uh, best, I guess, to some degree. And in my mind, uh, there's social, you know, Twitter is important because that's where you're going to build awareness. But what it really boils down to is that you need to be able to curate um, your, your audience. Um, and the best way to curate that is not on a web forum, uh, but it's through Discord. Um, because Discord, uh, one thing, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's a mobile and desktop application. Um, it's mostly used on desktop during the day when people are at work or on their phone at night. Um, and it's a good place to engage with people immediately to get immediate feedback. In fact, um, one other benefit of Discord, not only just because you talk to, your, to people who are playing the game, but is also being able to have people openly play test your stuff and help vet your ideas. I, I think there's nothing more valuable than being able to tap into your community to lend insight. Um, and granted, I don't, I don't think that you should be tapping your community for free work because exposure doesn't pay bills, but I think it's, I think it's worthwhile to ask your community questions. Um, and if you do it in an environment that you can control, because it's very hard to control the message on social media, because it's going to go off in many different tangents, the limitations of character counts, different opinions, et cetera, et cetera. But if you have a place where you have like an audience who's immediately like tied into your RPG, it's, it's actively talking about it. I think that's the best place to kind of, to really kind of focus a lot of your, your day-to-day -day engagements because you're going to get kind of you're going to get you're going to get the sort of feedback that you want that's constructive and filtered toward the game that you've created, um, and you can also use it as a, as a testing ground for marketing questions too. I think that there's a lot of value to be reaped um, from 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 your from your customers or your player base. Um, in Discord, to me, and it has been continues to be for for Angels like Meal with Svihander in particular, a, a, a really super focused place to talk about games, talk about our development, talk about what's happening behind the scenes and in a, in a place where you know, I spend probably two hours out of my day there, bare minimum. That's huge. And that is not at all what I was expecting. Uh, you know, that's why this is so beneficial. Uh, and it makes perfect sense, right? That, that you have a lot of, a lot of engagement in Discord. Those are the people who are sort of opting in to spend time with you. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's great. So along the lines of engaging fans, Azuko Games, uh, at Azuko Games on Twitter, wants to know, uh, how do I create a mailing list that people want to join? <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. So uh, so Azuko Games, yeah, I know who they are. They actually do some stuff for our, they have, we have a community content library program 
like the Dungeon Masters Guild at Drive to RPG called the Grown Girls Library. They we create things for that. Um, and that's yes. A- and quick shout out for that because uh, you uh, rated as of the first this year, you're giving creators uh, 60% royalties, right? Yeah. Uh, which is awesome. So thank you for that. Yeah, we do 60% royalties. And we also do print on demand for every product. Whoever wants it, you, you do it. Yeah. We're going to, we'll provide resources for it to help you out too. But, um, but yeah, so, so the, the, the mailing list question, um, I think we have to ask ourselves what the purpose of the mailing list is because I, it, 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 the great thing about email is in, in the, so if we think about the, the order of operations from the way people communicate, like people oftentimes will respond back immediately to a text message, a phone call they'll take if it's urgent but they, and, and they may listen to the voicemail. Email is typically a 24 hour response cycle. So the purpose of email is isn't always necessarily to 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 invoke an immediate response, but email can be what email is really useful for is is an awareness tool to allow people to understand when new products come out, when you may have something on sale, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that you know, looking at like how we built the mailing list for Zweihander one. It was first reaped uh, from all of our Kickstarter backers for Mongosh and Zweihander. That's where we kind of started because we wanted to build an audience that we would, you know, contact periodically. By periodically, I mean twice a month because you don't want to abuse your email list. Um, <clears throat> but we wanted to build a mail list where we can make people aware of kind of what's happening in the world of Zweihander. So I, and this is a little bit on my own personal history, I spent seven years uh, in the post.com bubble uh, working in the email CRM world. That was like my, that was like where I got my start in advertising was the use of email programs, uh, lead nurture programs uh, in particular uh, to create engagement uh, and to drive conversion. So this is something that's pretty, pretty, pretty close to my, my experience for, for the, the number of years I spent in advertising. Um, but when I think about it from the perspective of, of Zweihander, um, net, the, its purpose now is to drive sales for people's stuff they create on the Grow and Perilous library, to, to drive sales to other people's creations that are powered by Zweihander. But we built that list first from Kickstarter, from our backers. And we do see some periodic opt-ins. Uh, we do all com- double confirmed opt-in um, through our, our website, zweihander.game. Um, but but it's not a place where we're building a lot of people up. Although I will say that to come back to the giveaway question, we do giveaways at conventions, and we have people submit little pieces of paper that kind of confirm their opt in, and we use that to also build um, our email list with people who are voluntarily giving us their information on a little piece of paper, so we can enter them into when when you know a, a stack of games of. Spyhander. Um, so that's that's kind of two pathways I think you could you could you could you could use to build your list. But you what you can't do, and this is this has happened with some publishing companies in the in recent history, coincidentally, um, where they beg people to join their mailing list. Like it's not a viable strategy. Those are not the questions that you want to ask your people. You want to ask your audience to do. You want them to voluntarily say, "I want to learn more about the production schedule or more about information around." this RPG. So I'm going to opt in manually. Um, I think that every publisher out there, um, if you don't have an opt in form on your website, you should, um, but you don't want to make it a pop up. Uh, you don't want to put it at the top of the top of the page, put it at the bottom, make a bottom rocker. If you're using WordPress it's a very easy plugin to do it, but it's an easy way to build your list and you're going to get only people who are truly interested in the game to opt into it. Um, and definitely use a confirmed opt in approach. Don't, don't just, take an opt-in and not confirm their opt-in. Use MailChimp. That costs no money at all. There's a, a, a question from Matthew Eidler uh, on Twitter, at Matthew Eidler. Uh, wants to know, uh, what is the most low effort but high impact thing that we should be doing to market products? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, obviously... Uh, if we've learned anything from this conversation, it's that nothing is a silver bullet. Yeah. There's no like one thing that's going to, uh, you know, make or break a product. Well, I, I yeah, that, that's very true. Um, if, if, we keep, if we keep the conversation contained around 
the use of social media, the, the effective use of social media. One, one tactic, it's not a strategy, it's a tactic. One tactic you can employ uh, on, on social is it, it goes back to the idea of creating a thumb stopper. So, and, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll dig a little bit deeper into this because I talked about kind of briefly a moment ago. So when people are on Twitter and people who are listening are probably, you know, listening to this on podcast and they're on their phone right now and they're probably flipping through Twitter while they're listening to this and they're looking through different conversations and what, 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 what advertisers will do is to create what are called thumb stoppers. And usually that's like some big, bold image uh, that causes somebody to stop flipping. And they're like, oh, that's interesting. And maybe they like it. Maybe they share it. Maybe they, and, and hopefully they comment on it. That's like the, that's the, that, that to me is the kind of the rare thing that you can get people to do is to comment on your posts. But typically the rank stack order for a thumb stopper is they're either going to like it, they're going to retweet it or they will comment on it, which is like, the, that'd be amazing if they do. So what, what, we, what we can do as a tactic when we talk about our games online, as opposed to simply embedding a link um, and having Twitter pre-populate that image, because there, there's reasons why you don't do that. One, not every uh, Twitter app is made equal between devices. So sometimes Twitter will populate that image, even though you put the, if you put the URL in, sometimes they won't. Um, on desktop, uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It's, it's, it's really erratic in that way. So always, always, always include an image. If you, if, even if you have a URL link and it automatically populates that link, the thing that you do is you click that little X button at the top right-hand pane of the image, of the, of the URL link to dismiss the preview and embed an image link into it. And, and, and that is because one, you can tag people who helped work on the game with you in the image. One of the most valuable things that you can do. Um, two, it's better for the algorithm as opposed to using off-site pre-populated preview images. Instead, literally take an image from your phone or from your desktop and embed it in the post. Um, and three, you can tag all the people who work on the game because everyone wants to talk about the stuff they work on. And, and it's a really super shareable way to do it. So that's one, that's one tactic that you can use that's super, super low effort, um, but, but will, Im will, will improve uh, your engagement rates on social media uh, by, by using that image, by, by not using the preview image from the URL itself, but instead embedding an image in that by adding an image from your phone, from your desktop, whatever it may be, um, to, 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 to help drive awareness around your game. So at bad chili uh, with uh, three eyes, there's two eyes at the end. There's no bad chili. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, wants to know uh, how do you plan out your release schedule? And I would ask, add like what kind of marketing goes along with that, right? Um, because a lot of times, what I see creators doing are I also uh, worked in TV marketing for a long time before I was in RPGs and. You would see sometimes networks do what's called a launch and leave strategy, which is they make a big, big deal about like this show is going to be on our network. And then uh, once it actually launches for the 10 weeks it airs and then the reruns after that, there's not really a lot of marketing support after that, which is kind of a mistake. Uh, you you want to be able to build the show as it goes along. And I see that happen a lot in RPGs. Uh, and obviously, Spyhander did not do that. And that's not what you're doing with Andrews McNeil's product. So how, does a, uh, how do you plan a schedule and what does it look like? Yeah, so I, I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of, of a, an, an indie RPG creator, because I think that that is the experience that people who are asking these questions will best relate to, because the reality is, is that um, the people who are probably asking questions, yeah, I am a marketing department to own all this, um, but I, I, can, I can draw back on my own experience uh, for this. So my, my I just clearly in plain speak, my goals for the launch, one, I had to be, I had to like, make sure I didn't like talk about it until it was ready. That's, that's kind of the mistake I think a lot of people make because then you begin to, some people will build false expectations around that. It's really, it's really hard to, to want to, to, to really keep a lid on things sometimes. Um, and, and I think, you know, I think in fact, uh, anybody who works for wizards, uh, I think Hannah Rose talks about this a lot. It's like that NDA life, right? It should be a hashtag at this point because everybody is, like you have to NDA yourself if you're making a thing and not talk about it preemptively. Um, but once you're, once the thing is made, once it is either a digital thing 
or a physical thing that is going to happen. And this is this is assuming it's it's post Kickstarter or it's already funded or the thing already is like produced. Um, it, it, in my mind, uh, the way that you, you you do this effectively is that. You make the you, you you first off you drop you drop the the biggest weight you possibly can you know down which is boom here's the announcement here's the game I'm making here's what it's basically you give the thirty second the sixty second helicopter pitch which is like here's what it's called here's what it's about here's what it's like and here's how it's different um, that's you cover that in sixty seconds or within somehow you get that we make that fit within Twitter or Facebook in that post. That's the first thing that you do, and then you drive people to a landing page uh, that talks about it more explicitly. Don't don't waste your cycles or your word count on social media trying to stuff all that in. Create something that's super snappy and compelling that will get people to click through the landing page because that's that's one thing that's really challenging about social media, in particular for RPGs, is getting people to leave the platform to go to your website. There are some people who do this very effectively. Uh, Brandon Dixon with Swords Fall is masterful at this um, because he weaponizes the controversy against him to create compelling content, and people love it. And it's a brilliant approach. Um, and, and I think that even though it's not necessarily the, the right way, it is one way that you can do it. Um, but the, the way that the, was Zweihander was, I created the big announcement, drove them to the homepage, and then released a steady stream of content. And to put this in context, think about what happened after Explorers got the will to mount. So you the big so the leak comes out to Amazon. I'm going to use leaking quotes. Um, and 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 then the, the thing is announced and then you have a string of content on YouTube, on Dungeons and Dragons website from creators who are talking about it in material ways. The first thing I think that came out after the big after the announcement dropped, the official announcement is I saw two videos come up on YouTube immediately, and they're recommended to me on YouTube uh, with with Todd and others talking about the the new class, the new the new the new types of classes. So you know you can you can model some of that own your in your own behaviors uh, with with the game and a, and a product release schedule. But I think that the key here really is about producing a steady stream of content. It does not need to be daily. Um, it does not need to be released on the weekends, but it should be released during the time that people are most active on social media, which, which can hint, it is 11 a.m. Central in the United States. That is, that is the peak engagement time um, on, on Twitter. That's your, that's your window. So if you can post a little bit before, during the time or after um, your content, post two to three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, to me, that's a, a really smart way to do it. And continue publishing small snippets of content. Be cautious about releasing everything at once. Don't show. Don't open the kimono completely. Um, let let them see the ankle, the wrist. Let them, show them. You know, not to use like sexist terms here, but don't show them everything at once. Um, show them. You know what what may be relevant, what's on your mind that day. Something that you maybe developed from the game. Something that that you really want to show up. But don't show them everything because there's value in trickling out that content. Because what you want, what you want to do, uh, is surprise people um, with some fun things and delight them with the things they didn't expect. So I think su surprise and delight is kind of the. I, mean, I think everyone across the, many industries understands this concept. It's like certain people have people have an expectation of what they're going to receive, but if you can surprise and delight them with something above and beyond that, that's awesome. Set up a content calendar. Um, I, I can't stress that strongly enough. I use Buffer. As an example, to schedule a lot of content, like I, on Sundays, I'll sit down and say, what are some topics I want to talk about this week? I think about it from the perspective of a content creator. Um, like, what do I want to talk about this week? And I kind of make a quick punch list for that. And I'll schedule most of it. And I'll do some interactions periodically on social media beyond that. But I have a content schedule I kind of stick to. I think that if you can really, one, be care careful and cautious about not talking about things before they're ready. Um, and then two, after you make your announcement, create a steady stream of content that's super shareable. Um, that is a that is a ironclad strategy. Now, granted, there's a lot of tactics that go into that. There's a lot of kind of caveats within that, but it's it's a, it's a general strategy that I think anybody can use, whether they be an indie RPG creator, a creator for the Dungeon Masters Guild, or even a big publisher. Um, 
those things work uh, on a micro and macro level. And modeling modeling that same behavior is is a really good approach to to creating a steady stream of content that's shareable and continues to build awareness around the RPG you're making. Yeah, I that's a that's a great thing, and a lot of the really. Uh, prolific and uh, most followed content creators I know do that, right? They sit down, they think about what they're going to talk about. They schedule things uh, to to make sure that they come out on time. And I think that that's uh, a really smart way to, uh, to do things. And it doesn't mean that it's not a genuine way you're engaging with people or, or talking to people. I think sometimes when we talk about marketing, people feel icky because they feel like they're reminded of like a snake oil salesman, but you're not selling snake oil, right? You're selling something that you've poured your heart and soul into in most cases. That's, that's right. And I think that, you know, and I, I know we have other questions lined up, but I do want to talk about that for a moment. Cause I think there's a, you're right. There is a perception. There's an ickiness to marketing. And I, and I think that marketing, marketing can be done in one of two ways. Either you can, it's the silence brand. Like it's the it's the get out of my social media conversations. I don't want to know about your thing. Like there are bad ways you could use marketing, um, and there are human ways you could use marketing. And I think that, and this is like a whole other thing to unwind. But I don't want to quite get into during this. Uh, some of it's a little bit secret sauce, but being able to humanize your marketing is so incredibly important to where. To the point where people don't even recognize that it's marketing. Like that's the that's the end state. Um, to to make it feel like a casual conversation because it should be. It should be a, a conversation about the games that you're creating without saying, "Play my game, try my game, check this out. It's awesome." Like, and it's tough. It's really, really, really difficult to make it feel natural and then for it to organically grow into a conversation online. Um, and, and there are many different approaches there, obviously, but. But I think that as RPG creators, as indie creators, as publishers in particular, we have to, we, we, we obviously recognize that marketing is not, is, is kind of a, it can feel icky and gross, but we have to do it. We have to. I, I'm, I, and I, I think it's, I think there's, there's nothing wrong with creating things that you don't intend to monetize. But the point where you ask somebody, Hey, give me a dollar. Um, you kind of have a responsibility as a publisher to make something that's been play tested, to make something that's good, and to talk about that in, in ways that feel natural and organically. I think that there, there are several cases I can think of, because I think failure is as important as success. There are several cases I can look back historically on my own account was Viander, the early days of marketing where I clearly stumbled. I was all over web forums. Like I was spending all my time there engaging in conversations in inorganic ways. And it did nothing uh, positive for the brand at the time. <clears throat> and unfortunately, you know, I, I took that, took the lessons learned, took those failures and said, okay, I need to pivot my approach because this is not the right way to engage with people. Um, and, and so I changed that level of engagement. And, and, I, and I would say because I moved toward social media and it became more of an opt-in conversation as opposed to with forums, it's like, it's the wild west. You don't opt into every every single conversation, but you get flooded with it regardless. Uh, but in Twitter, you can control who you're hearing from. You can be in, Twitter will promote you into conversations that may be of interest to you. You will engage with people that you want to hear from. So the conversations are far more natural. And I think that there is room within those margins to, to, to quote market um, in soft human ways. I think as long as we can remember at the end of the day that we're talking to to other people on the other side of the d the digital fence, so to speak, it's not it's not just a frock of pixels. It's a person. Um, I think if you can humanize those conversations, you can change that perception about marketing being this kind of gross thing that we do to something that is appreciated. Because I think at the end of the day, like everybody wants to talk to James about the cool stuff you're working on, right? They want to know about the cool stuff you're working on. And and even though you may or you may not be doing it from a marketing perspective. You're talking about those things in natural, organic ways. And in, in my mind, like the utopia, the marketing utopia is where people can talk to creators and companies in open, open conversation, um, controlled conversation, uh, meaning it's very directional conversation about the things that they're working on and be excited and, and, and engage with it and share it. And that's like, if we can, if we can move toward that, that'd be amazing. We won't, but, but I think that there, there, 
there are, there are ways that we can do that as independent creators to, to encourage that sort of conversation where it isn't seen as kind of icky sales, stick oil salesman approach um, and make it more natural and, and uh, 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 more willing for people to talk and engage in that way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree a thousand percent, right? That and and we as creators in many respects, uh, and this is true not just in RPGs, but in in any industry, you become a brand yourself. And the things that you say online affect your your brand and the things that you make, whether or not they are directly related. And I think that's hugely important too. Um, you know, we, uh, you mentioned Brandon Dixon earlier. One of the things that I like about Brandon Dixon is, uh, he and I agree morally on a lot of things. Right. And so that is what originally drove me to check out Swordsfall is I was like, I like what this guy has to say. And I think about that a lot too, like, you know, uh, being a, a, a real person and obviously, Choosing what you should and should not share online, I think, is a big part of that. Um, what you choose not to say is as important as what you choose to say. So uh, I think we got time for one more here. And I am going to throw it back to uh, Justice Armin, who asks, so there are all of these sort of perceptions about marketing that we have that like, if you're not going viral, uh, that your product is, is failing, right? That if, you're, uh, if your tweet doesn't break, you know, uh, a thousand likes, if your Reddit post uh, d- dies before it reaches 50 upvotes, um, your Kickstarter isn't funded in the first 24 hours, that like your product is dead, not viable, not good. Is this true? And uh, if so, how can a solo or even a small team of RPG creators set themselves up for success to have a great initial push? Yeah, so that's a, that's a, a really interesting observation. And, and I think, I think, this kind of stems from something that is kind of an external pressure outside of the RPG industry, which is the need to be spoken about online. Um, there, there, and this is really something that's unique. I think that's kind of come um, in the wake of social media, which is if people aren't talking about you or your product, you're going to fail. And, but the reality is, is that we have, you know, 25 plus years, 30 years uh, of RPGs being made without social media. Um, a lot of a lot of designers and, and companies spent many many years growing awareness through organized play programs, through going to conventions, through you know like uh, you know ho- hoping it you know back way this way and that from their hotel with a stack of books on their back and building awareness by interacting with audiences face to face. And those those approaches are still equally as valid as social media. Social media. Um, I think it has created this this interesting pressure um, on on first time creators if they don't have audience if they don't have if they may not they may not necessarily have like a high touch relationship with with our other RPG players at conventions whatever it may be there's a there's an external pressure to say um, if we're not being talked about on social media how can we possibly succeed and and and, and some of that some of that is true um, some of it is 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 a founded fear. Um, some of it is, 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 you know, maybe it's just for, for, for people who've been around for a while, like it's a little different. Um, but I think there are many different approaches to building awareness around RPGs, social media. And it's been really kind of the thrust of this conversation is like social media kind of is the place where people are talking about games and, and it's really, really hard to, to, to get, to get your, your, your tweets, um, promoted on the algorithm um, I can tell you, you know, one of the, I wouldn't call it a low cost thing, but one thing you can consider, um, which I, I use, is to use promote mode in Twitter. So Twitter's extended to, uh, I think it's now open beta for you to be able to take, if you have a certain number of followers, you can actually turn your, your Twitter profile into promote, which costs, like, I think it's $99 a month. It's, it's not inexpensive by any means, but... Um, it will help. It will help boost your engagement with people who are talking about the same things that you are. This is this kind of goes back to the reasons why hashtags uh, should be used in your post when you talk about RPGs because it will create interconnectivity within the algorithm to people who are talking about other games. Because the the the, the, the 
the awareness building thing, what it really boils down to is most conversations about RPGs that are happening online are about D&D. Um, and, and people who are playing D&D are certainly looking for other games, um, in particular people, you know, not just people who have been playing D&D for a long time, but people who, who play D&D that are now in that four to five year cycle. I've played D&D, I want to try something new. Um, that's an ample opportunity to, to put your game in front of them. So uh, there are ways you can do that. Like I mentioned before, some of the tactics around use your hashtag tactic, um, using a content calendar to, to produce regular content, um, to use promote mode as an example, like I mentioned before. Um, but but they're, they're, I think really to get people to talk about your game in the best way is just to keep your, is to humanize your content, humanize your conversations. Um, and intrigue and invite people to check things out. I, a great example of this, um, a friend of mine, uh, Nick, produced a game. Nick Landry uh, is working on a game called Space Kids RPG. Um, in fact, Hannah Rose uh, is going to be the editorial developer on it for him. And, and I had this, the, and, and he and I met kind of casually uh, at, at Gen Con and we forged this friendship. And, and keep in mind, this guy, so he's a HoloLens developer, right? He comes from outside the industry. He's never made an RPG before. And he's like, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, just talk about your game online in a fun, organic way. And, and it worked for him. Like, you know, his Kickstarter, like, game busters. Like, it raised the money he needed uh, to afford the artwork, to afford the additional writing, editors, all that stuff. And, and, he, and the way he succeeded was just by, as opposed to trying to interpose himself uh, you know, artificially in every single conversation, uh, he would talk about, uh, he talked because his game's geared for, for, for parents with their kids who were younger than age 11 to play RPG. So he would reach out to Shannon Germain, who worked on No Thank You Evil. He, he reached out to Kira Kid Games. He reached out to other people just to say, hey, I'm, I, I made this kid's RPG. I'd love to hear your feedback on it. Hey, parents, let's talk about what your RPG experience is with your kids, what games are they playing? What games are you excited to talk about? What games are you excited to put in front of them? You know, what are the ways that things that, what are the ways that you think that you could get kids interested in sci-fi again? Like these kind of very natural, these questions that he had put the audience. And, and I can tell you that um, the way to immediately generate a lot of engagement on social media is to ask a question and set up a poll. Um, and even though these, these posts aren't meant to, draw attention to the RPG you're making, um, they will bring the algorithms to your favor. And what they will do on the back end is when people are talking about D&D and other RPG games, and you're also talking about D&D RPG games, including your own, it'll start to sync those things up to where their posts will be uh, fall within that, that recommended list they have now for Twitter, for other conversations, uh, for friends of friends who are talking about games. So a uh, long story short, uh, keeping the conversation human, um, making sure every conversation conversation isn't necessarily geared toward touting your game, uh, talking about it in a very organic way, using the tactics that I've kind of described. I feel that what you can do, um, particularly in, in a time where the barrier to entry for RPGs, making your own thing, through, whether it be crowdfunding through Kickstarter, distribution through drive through RPG or itch, like those barriers are really low right now. Um, I think that there, there are, there are ways if you, if you kind of remember that the other person on the other side of the screen is a human to talk about your game and talk to them in a human way that you can create a, a strategy that will bring attention to your indie RPG and, and, and should the stars align. And, and I certainly hope that they do for people. Um, you can have your, your project crowdfunded and raise the money to make it and be successful and put that feather in your cap and say, I made a thing because there's nothing, there's nothing more, even if you never generate a dollar, there's nothing more satisfying than to know like you've made a thing and it's online. People can download it and play it. And, and it's so, it's, uh, it's scary and it's awesome and it's, it's neat. And it's, and it's, it's all these different emotions that kind of evokes uh, when I think about Zweihander from that perspective. But um, I don't think Zweihander is an exception to the rule. Um, it certainly came out. It's kind of like me in a bottle, right place, right time. A lot of my own experience led lended toward its growth. The marriage with Anders McNeil certainly changed things dramatically. But I don't think that 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 opportunity is gone. And I think that there are little opportunities within within the space right now for games to grow very very quickly, um, organically, and to make 
whether your RPG is a $500 thing or a $50,000 thing, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of interest uh, in the RPG industry from fans to try new games. Um, don't be afraid to 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 create something, um, but just make sure when you're talking about those things online to avoid the you know to avoid the you know like the icky marketing stuff. Is like just really talk talk about from a human perspective. I can't I can't underscore that enough because that is really the way to get people intrigued and engaged. Um, and to, and to really remember at the end of the day, like, it's, it's just, it's just a bunch of, we're just a bunch of RPG nerds talking about games together. And that's, uh, that's the, be- that's the, the best approach I can recommend. That's awesome. And I think you and I could probably talk about this all day, but I know we've got other things we've got to do. So before we go though, uh, one final marketing push, where can people find you and Zweihander on the internet? So uh, the best place to find Zweihander is at zweihander.game. Um, I own that domain, which is super awesome. <laughs> and it, it, re- it redirects kind of the homepage for, for all things, our Discord, our marketing, our, our product channels, our Grim and Perilous library at DriveThruRPG, our community content program, um, our Facebook page. But you can find me personally um, on, on Twitter at ZweihanderRPG. Um, and I monitor the hashtag TTRPG marketing. So if you have a question and haven't tagged me, or if you want to just have general questions about or comments around your own experience with, with TTRPG marketing, either tag me at ZweihanderRPG or just put the hashtag TTRPG marketing. Um, and more than likely, I will drop in the conversation and try to lend any insight and ask any questions about your own experience. So I'd love to hear about people's successes and failures and opportunities uh, within that. To me, that's a, a fun thing for me, even though my, my world today is as creative director. Um, I don't, I don't really drive a lot of marketing anymore, but, um, um, but uh, I love talking about these things because I, I, I spent so many years, you know, 16 years in advertising. So these things are fun to talk about. And I want to, and I want to share that information and share that experience with people so we can all, we can all succeed in our own unique ways. So that's, that's, that's where I'm at. That's awesome. Daniel, thank you so much for joining me today on Tabletop Babble. I really appreciate it. Thanks again, James. Really appreciate the opportunity. And thank you everybody who submitted questions. This was, this was super cool. Uh, It's always, it's always kind of humbling to be asked questions like this. Um, And it's also kind of embarrassing. So like, I, I, I'm sure you can see my cheeks are like flushed red because I I think it's always, it's always really fun to be, to talk about these things. So thank you again for the opportunity, James, and um, hope to talk again soon. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. And again, thank you to everybody who asked questions. That was really awesome. That was a great interview with Daniel D. Fox. Thank you so, so much for listening. People, you can head on over to patreon.com slash intracasso where you can support the show with your dollars and get a bunch of free extras or head on over to Apple Podcasts. Leave us a five-star review. You can make me say anything you want. Plus, it will help other people find the show. And hey, you can find me on Twitter at James Intracasso, that's at J-A-M-E-S-I-N-T-R-O-C-A-S-O, and at worldbuilderblog.com. Don't forget to check out fantasticlayers.com as well. Tabletop Babble is a show on the Don't Split the Podcast Network, edited by Nate Pauzenga. Thanks to Rudy Basso for founding DSPN with me. Our theme music, which you're listening to right now, was provided by Battle Bards. Everybody have a great day. I'm Lisa Chen, and I host Behold Her, a monthly podcast that shines a spotlight on women in the world of tabletop games. There are so many women to behold in this amazing hobby, and our experiences as female gamers are as diverse as we are as individuals. Through one-on-one interviews, audio essays, and panel discussions, all centered around a monthly theme, the guests on Behold Her share their unique stories as players, game masters, designers, artists, organizers, and so much more. Their words are inspiring, uplifting, and informative. Check out Behold Her Podcast wherever podcasts are found or visit beholdherpodcast.com.